Harondor, or South Gondor, the land between the Poros and Harnan rivers, is one of only three regions in Middle-earth that are not only named, but are described on Christopher Tolkien's map of Middle-earth at the end of the Third Age. We may note the lost realm of Arnor. To the northeast of that, we can read, here was of old the witch realm of Angmar. And far to the south, where the map grows featureless, we find South Gondor, now a debatable and desert land. In 2015, Blackwell's Rare Books released a transcribed version of a map of Middle-earth that had been in the possession of illustrator Pauline Baines. This map is not really of interest for the map itself, it is basically Christopher Tolkien's version, but for the annotations. J.R.R. Tolkien marked the map with notes and arrows to guide Baines in her development of her famous poster map of 1970. But any readers hoping to learn more about the region immediately south of Athelion, and perhaps there were not many, would be disappointed. The annotated map of Middle-earth has no annotations for Harondor. Whereas Tolkien specifically suggested camels and elephants be placed on the map in Harad, or near Harad to be precise, no animals, plants, or notes of any kind are suggested for Harondor, and none appear there in Bane's map. Only Farodwaith is more featureless than South Gondor. But Harondor grew as Tolkien's world unfolded. An early map, drawn between 1937 and 1949, when Tolkien was writing The Lord of the Rings, identifies Harondor as a narrow land south of the Ether Anduin, along the coast. The Ethel Duath bulk out westward south of the Poros, taking up rather more than the eastern half of Harondor as later depicted. The Harnan has its source in these hills, arising in the approximate center of the later Harondor, and flowing due south before turning westward to empty in the sea. To the east of this Harnan, Haradwaith is marked. This early Harondor seems indeed to have been hardly more than a southern province of Gondor, similar in size to the fief of Lebanon or Athelion. Unlike the later published maps, this draft contains no text to describe Harondor's role as a boundary between warring peoples. Only the words Harondor and beneath that in parentheses S. Gondor appear on this map. In a note from 1966, Tolkien places Harondor on the borders of the north, that is, the region in which Gandalf was known as Gandalf, as opposed to the south, where he was known as Inkanush. Tolkien writes, The bounds of this region were naturally vague. Its eastern frontier was roughly the river Carnan to its junction with Kelduin, the river running, and so to Nernan and thence south to the ancient confines of South Gondor. The north thus includes all this great area, roughly west to east from the Gulf of Loon to Nernan, and north and south from Karn Doom to the southern bounds of ancient Gondor, between it and near Harad. Beyond Nernan, Gandalf had never gone. Beyond the ancient confines of South Gondor was Harad. In this same note, Tolkien identifies Harad as a vague term, and although before its downfall men of Numenor had explored the coasts of Middle-earth far southward, their settlements beyond Umbar had been absorbed, or being made by men already in Numenor corrupted by Sauron, had become hostile in parts of Sauron's dominions. But the southern regions in touch with Gondor, and called by men of Gondor simply Harad, south, near or far, were probably both more convertible to the resistance, and also places where Sauron was most busy in the Third Age, since it was a source to him of manpower most readily used against Gondor. Into these regions Gandalf may well have journeyed in the earlier days of his labors. Tolkien would later revise these views. Instead of interpreting Inkanush as a form adapted to Quenya of a word in the tongue of the Haradrim meaning simply North Spy, in 1967 Tolkien would posit a purely Quenya origin for Inkanush, combining elements signifying mind and ruler, and imagining Gandalf going no farther south than those lands under the suzerainty of Gondor at the height of its power. Still, both conceptions place South Gondor exactly on the border between the regions of the north-centered legends that preoccupy Tolkien's writings and the vague lands of the south, from which come only scraps of detail, a handful of words in an alien tongue, and no tales at all. Harondor is in many ways the ultimate non-place in Middle-earth, a world already rich in phantom realms. Angmar had its witch king, Arnor its successor states, Khand had its variags and ruin its easterlings from the defiant aggression of the Wainriders to the savage rabble of the Balkoth. Umbar has its villains, its tragic pride, and the Southrons shake their red-tipped spears. 
We are even allowed to picture the numerous and barbarous fisher folk dwelling about the mouth of the Guathlo, and the snowmen of Forochel who run on the ice with bones on their feet. Yet Harondor, South Gondor, the province between the powers, has no heroes. But fans abhor a vacuum. If you want to find more detailed maps of Harondor, you can find them easily enough, populated with settlements, roads, rivers, and hills, all absent from canonical sources. Yet these attempts never quite sit right. The vision of a crowded, populous Harondor in almost any period conflicts too greatly with what Tolkien seems to want to convey about this region, not only in the fact of how little he allows us to see of it, but of how little he enables us to say of it, at least directly. Though it seems peripheral by the time of the War of the Ring, the land between Poros and Harnan lay near the heart of Gondor's power for some 400 years, the trans Anduin mirror to Lebanon and Dol Amroth. The lands extending on either side of the great river's mouths are quickened by the same sea airs and nourished by the same waters. Since the time of the ship kings of Gondor, the folk who dwelt here had been subject to the crown. They had witnessed the grinding, decades-long siege of Umbar, they saw the subjugation of the Harad, whose princes passed through their lands to live as hostages at the court of the king. When the wealth of the kingdom became a thing of legend, they were there, and when the land was torn apart by civil war, their departure from the kingdom, or rather the kingdom's failure to retain them, signaled the end of Gondor's hold upon the south for over a millennium and a half. No books tell their story, no songs list their triumphs, but Harondor, as a felt lack, would exert a pull on its neighbors, and trouble the stratagems of the kings. Gondor would not be whole without it. As we have seen, the map of Middle-earth describes Harondor as desert, but it was not a desert in the geographical sense. There is indeed cause to suppose that the fertility of Athelion, its landscape of woods and herbed glades, was not restricted to the northern side of the Poros. The breeze that quickened growth in Athelion blew also in Harondor, and the camels that appear in Pauline Bain's map of Middle-earth appear only beyond the Harnan. We should not imagine sand dunes in South Gondor. Now the desert nature of Harondor is due to politics rather than geography. War, not weather, made South Gondor a wasteland. The phrase debatable land offers a clue and an analogy to Harondor's history. The debatable lands were a small stretch of land on the Anglo-Scottish border. The land was not debatable only between the English and Scottish crowns, but was effectively an independent region where local clan leaders held more control than either government. A similar situation is likely to have held in Harondor, at least for a little while, as we will see. Harondor was not a Maginot line or no man's land separating Gondor from Harad or Umbar, nor was it vast uninhabited desert. It was desert because it could not be effectively used, much like desert in earlier English usage was applied to any land that could not be settled for agriculture, and it was debatable not only because the Corsairs and Gondor fought there, although notably there are no recorded military clashes between the Poros and the Harnan, but because for many centuries no great power could capture the allegiance of what inhabitants remained. For all the focus in our tales on the north and west of Middle-earth, the story of Gondor is in part also the story of the South, and Harondor is where those forces of Dúnedain and Southron, known and unknown, met, mingled, and warred. For long after its fall, neither King of Gondor nor Corsair Lord would fill the void that they themselves had made. What little is known of the earliest history of the land between the Poros and the Harnan, as well as the nearby territories, may be briefly told. Of the year Second Age 1800, we read in the tale of years that from about this time onward the Numenorians begin to establish dominions on the coasts. Umbar would be made into a great fortress of Numenor in Second Age 2280. Seventy years later, we read, Pelargir is built. It becomes the chief haven of the faithful Numenorians. Pelargir, like Umbar, seems to have been more than a haven. Quote, in the days of their power, the mariners of Numenor had established a haven and strong places about the mouths of Anduin, in despite of Sauron and the black land that lay nigh upon the east. In the later days, to this haven came only the faithful of Numenor, and many, therefore, of the folk of the coastlands in that region were in whole or in part akin to the elf friends and the people of Elendil, and they welcomed his sons. <laughs> 
The strong places about the mouths of Anduin could well have included land south of the Great River, in what would later be South Athelian and Harondor, though in the downfall of Numenor the coastlands were changed. Pilargir, which had been on the coast, was now far inland. We may suppose that a similar extension of the coasts had occurred south of the Anduin as well, so that any strong places built beside the sea in the Second Age were now some hundred miles from the shore. If such fortresses had in fact been made in Harondor, their ruins could perhaps be found near the southern bend of the Poros. In Of the Rings of Power in the Third Age, we read of Sauron preparing for what would be known as the War of the Last Alliance. Quote, Sauron gathered to him great strength of his servants out of the east and the south, and among them were not a few of the high race of Numenor. For in the days of the sojourn of Sauron in that land, the hearts of well-nigh all its people had been turned towards darkness. Therefore many of those who sailed east in that time and made fortresses and dwellings upon the coasts were already bent to his will, and they served him still gladly in Middle-earth. But because of the power of Gilgalad, these renegades, lords both mighty and evil, for the most part took up their abodes in the south lands far away. Yet two there were, Herumor and Fuinur, who rose to power among the Haradrim, a great and cruel people that dwelt in the wide lands south of Mordor beyond the mouths of Anduin. The last part of this passage, the word yet, seems to suggest that Herumor and Fuinur were not so far away from Gilgalad as the other renegades, who took up their abodes in the southlands beyond the lands shown in our maps. Could they have arisen in the land between the Poros and the Harnan? The wide lands south of Mordor beyond the mouths of Anduin could apply to Harondor, but this seems difficult to reconcile with the earlier statement that in the later days to this haven of Pelargir came only the faithful of Numenor. If the mouths of Anduin constitute essentially Elendil territory, then it is difficult to see precisely how these two renegades would have risen to power among the Haradrim in what would later be South Gondor. More likely, Herumor and Fuinur rose to power in Umbar, or further inland. That leaves Harondor as being already closely tied to, if not yet part of, Gondor. Gondor's borders shortly after its founding are not specified, but three of its main cities, Osgiliath, Minas Anor, and Minas Ithil, are named during the war with Sauron. While the period involved is lengthy, the concentration of Gondor's power is primarily upriver during the Second Age. While Pilargur was founded by the faithful and was friendly to the Elendili who established Gondor, we are not sure when or how precisely Pelargir was incorporated into Gondor's territory. Presumably it was added by some treaty rather than by force. At this time the strong places that had been made around the Anduin, including any south of it, assuming they had survived into the Third Age, could have been added as well. But we will need to wait 800 years and more into the Third Age to find further evidence of Gondor involving itself in territory south of the Poros. To the year 3rd Age 830, we may assign the incorporation of the coasts of Harondor into Gondor under Terranon Falaster. He, quote, began the line of the ship kings, who built navies and extended the sway of Gondor along the coasts west and south of the mouths of Anduin. But it was Terranon's successor, Aarnil I, who repaired the ancient haven of Pelargir and built a great navy. Prior to this, Pelargir may have been a settlement of Gondor, but not fully useful as a haven due to the reshaping of the coasts that had followed the downfall of Numenor and left Pelargir farther inland than it had been in the Second Age. So, while Terranon likely used ships as part of his expansion of the kingdom, Gondor was not yet the great naval power that it would be. A further clue may suggest that Terranon's activities were largely land-based. We are told that, to commemorate his victories as captain of the hosts, Terranon took the crown in the name of Falaster, Lord of the Coasts. Captain of the Hosts sounds like the counterpart to the later title Captain of Ships, and would seem to denote leadership of the army. Since, as we have seen, Terranon lacked a great navy during his expeditions, these victories would seem to have been traditional land battles. But why were the coasts in particular targeted? Perhaps because they were more accessible or richer than regions further inland. These may have been areas of previous Numenorean settlement. If so, it seems likely that now they were inhabited by men of different ancestry. Men of darkness, as Faramir might reckon it, whose fathers had always dwelt in Middle-earth and had, in the days of Sauron's dominion, worshipped him as a god. 
With Sauron's defeat many centuries in the past, these men would have dwindled in power and number, and perhaps some of their descendants would have become friendly with the men of Gondor who now rose in strength. Their daughters, however, seem not to have wedded with these Dúnedain. Historians of Gondor later observed that it was the black Numenorians of Umbar, descendants of the king's men, who intermarried with the peoples of Harad. The hint of condemnation of this practice suggests that similar marriages did not occur in Gondor. A perception of a distinction between the Dúnedain of Gondor and the nearby natives of the coasts and inland regions would have made it easier to justify conquest of their territories. While there is evidence for military aggression on both sides, such as the fact that Minas Honor was said to have been raised as a shield against the wild men of the Dales, Gondor's communication with inland non-Numenorean folk began very early, most famously with Isildur's strained relationship with the men of the White Mountains. Similar claims of overlordship are likely to have been exercised south of the Poros, certainly during the time of the Ship Kings. Out of this conflict or grudging acceptance, may have grown some early additional shoots of disaffection with Gondor, which may account in part for some of the rebellion that we will see in the southern provinces just prior to the kinstrife. Terenon's victories are remarkable enough to be noted in the sources, but seem not to have been particularly hard fought. We hear of no lengthy campaigns of subduel along the coasts. The greatest challenge for Gondor lay to the south, in the form of the oldest Numenorean settlement of all, Umbar, whose lords must have watched the growing power of Gondor with some dismay. We may imagine them supporting local resistance to Gondor's expansion, or perhaps even resisting this expansion themselves. On the other hand, there is the barest hint of friendly, or at least non-hostile, contact between Gondor and Umbar during this time. Queen Beruthiel was the nefarious, solitary, and loveless wife of Tyrannon. We do not know her origin, but King Tyrannon had her set on a ship alone with her cats and set adrift on the sea before a north wind. The ship was last seen flying past Umbar under a sickle moon. It has been theorized by Lilaeth in the Third Realm in Exile that Beruthiel was from Umbar, and the marriage was diplomatic or political in nature. If so, its object failed. But even if the theory of a political marriage between Gondor and Umbar is discounted, News of Beruthiel's ship reached Gondor from Umbar, well before Umbar itself fell into the hands of the kings. Some kind of communication between the two realms then existed. Tyrannon's successor Ayarnil would take the step of conquering Umbar itself, an attack which is given no justification in the sources. Perhaps Umbar's lords began the conflict reacting to the repudiation of Beruthiel or to the expansion of the heirs of Elendil, which itself prompted a response from Gondor. Or perhaps the attack was simply unprovoked an act of pure aggression in Gondor's adolescence. In 933, Aarnil laid siege by sea and land to Umbar, taking it at great cost. This campaign may have been the first large-scale military action to take place in Third Age Harondor, albeit indirectly. At most, Aarnil's land forces may have marched through the region. But the costly taking of Umbar would only be the beginning of the difficulties Gondor would face in holding this ancient Numenorean region. Some 80 years after their expulsion, the lords of Umbar would rally the Haradrim and attempt to take it back. In the reign of Kyriehir, the year 1015 saw the beginning of a 35-year siege of Gondorian Umbar, culminating in a spectacularly successful campaign against the kings of the Harad. In 1050, crossing the river Harnan, Kyriehir's armies utterly defeated the men of the Harad, and their kings were compelled to acknowledge the overlordship of Gondor. Kyriehir then took the name of High Armendikil, South Victor. The might of High Armendikil no enemy dared to contest during the remainder of his long reign. The kings of the Harad did homage to Gondor, and their sons lived as hostages in the court of its king. In order for Gondor to maintain presence and power south of the Harnan, both Umbar and the Haradrim needed to be controlled. One could not be held in check without the other. Without Umbar, Gondor's hold upon the men of the Harad was loosened. It is this fact which the analysts indicate in the context of the later kinstrife, the first great evil to come upon Gondor, which resulted in the loss of Umbar and thus opened South Gondor to devastation by its enemies. Umbar then must have been not only a center for sea power and fleets, but a staging point from which armies could march far inland at need. This has implications for the terrain of the hinterlands of Umbar and of Haradwaith. While there were no doubt deserts in the south, we should probably not imagine endless wasteland stretching inland from Umbar, 
for Umbar to be a suitable location from which to exert a hold upon the men of the Harad, whose lands extended for hundreds of miles, it must have been plausible for armies to march efficiently from Umbar itself to wherever they were needed. This implies suitable land for foraging, and probably roads of some kind, though the only road in their region, the Harad Road, loses detail after crossing the Harnan. The road continues into Haradwaith, but apparently the cartographer had no clearer sense of its course than this. However, together with the statement that Umbar was used to control the Haradrim, we may imagine a network of roads in the Haradwaith that were capable of providing passage to Gondor's forces, and countryside that was capable of providing supply. Apart from this, Umbar's significance for the domination of the men of Harad was simply geographical. The Haradrim could not lightly cross the Harnan and invade Gondor with the threat of a manned Umbar behind them. The tale of Gondor's hold upon the men of the south must be a fascinating one, but we get only glimpses. First contact between Numenorians and men of Middle-earth in the region would have occurred in the legendary days of the Second Age, at first marked by peaceful exchange, later by exploitation, slavery, and sacrifice. When Gondor began its period of expansion in the 9th century of the Third Age under Terranon, no doubt the extension of its borders did not go uncontested. Indeed, we are told that during this first millennium of Gondor's history, war never ceased on their borders, whether from Easterlings, Saldrons, other Dúnedain, or native middlemen living in and around the White Mountains. The first specific recorded conflict with Haradrim does not occur until the time of Kiriandil, the father of Kiriahir High Armendakil. This first attack comes on the heels of Gondor's taking of Umbar, which the men of Harad must have seen as an ominous sign. This understanding of the threat Umbar would pose in the hands of a strong Gondor must have hastened the alliance and mingling of the descendants of the King's Men and the Southrons. For some eighty years after the taking of Umbar, the men of the Harad, led by the lords that had been driven from Umbar, came up with great power against the stronghold, and Kiriandil fell in battle in Haradwaith. The leadership of these exiled lords of Umbar over the Haradrim is interesting in light of what we read later, that when Higher Mendicil came down across the Harnan with his several armies and utterly defeated the men of the Harad after decades of siege, their kings were compelled to acknowledge the overlordship of Gondor. Of course, Harad is not a single nation, but it is still notable that these kings of Harad did not take the lead in the assault against Umbar, but rather the exiled lords. This suggests that at least part of the people of Harad looked to Umbar for leadership, and unsurprisingly that at least some of the manpower of the lords of Umbar would have come from the Haradrim dwelling in and around the region. In other words, we have from Third Age 1015 at least, and no doubt stretching back to much earlier times, a segment of the population of Harad aligning themselves with Umbar rather than with Gondor. And while strife between Umbar and Southrons must have occurred, this cooperation between them would be a feature of much of the later history of the peoples. This first war between Gondor and the Haradrim was long, lasting from 1015 to 1050, but when it ended, Hyarmendikil I could claim a decisive victory in the south that would settle affairs in the region for some 500 years. The annals make the sparse but pregnant statement, Hyarmendikil conquers the Harad for the year 1050. We are not to interpret this as a partial or compromised victory. By the time of this victory, it is beyond question that the region of South Gondor was firmly in Gondor's hands, since otherwise High Armendikil would not have been secure enough to march across the River Harnan, no doubt following the route of the Harad Road. Until the Kinstrife, Harandor would apparently remain free from war on its borders. With the resolution of the long siege of Umbar, we hear nothing more of the lords that Gondor had driven from the stronghold, and so any surviving lords of Numenorean descent who held a grudge against the Elendili would probably have fled southward, rather than remain in the service of kings of Harad who paid homage to Gondor. And it seems that the loyalty of the Haradrim would follow whoever held Umbar, for with Gondor's possession of the cape and its strongholds, the Haradrim caused no trouble for its kings. But when Castamir's sons established their stronghold and independent lordship there in 1448, the alignment of the south could turn at last against the heirs of Elendil. The years after High Armendikil's reign must have been Harandor's golden age, when the region was peaceful, a safe part of a strong kingdom with subdued or friendly neighbors, and in close contact with the capital. There must have been villas, vineyards, great agriculture or pasturage, and much traffic along the Harad Road. But Higher Mendicil's great military progress through Harondor was an ominous foretaste 
of the fact of geography that would both make the region a crucial part of Gondor's position in the south and doom it in the coming centuries. It's lying between Gondor's chief territories along the Lower Anduin and its major enemies beyond the Harnin. Four centuries, it seems, was too little time to integrate South Gondor fully into the kingdom, to strengthen it with fortified cities, or to people it with folk who would remain loyal to the crown. Gondor was always a place torn between the old alliances and enmities of the past, north and south, east and west, land and sea. Poised at the crossroads of conflicts in the long history of Middle-earth, it was inevitable that these conflicts should play out in miniature during the tragedy of the Kinstrife. The Kinstrife was called by the analysts the first great evil to befall Gondor, in which great loss and ruin was caused and never fully repaired. Though Gondor would survive, for the first time in its history its borders would withdraw, and the South Kingdom would lose a territory that was equal or greater in size to the vast fields of Calinardon. The Civil War would be sparked by a marriage. In 1250, two years after a great victory over the Easterlings, the regent Minalcar, later King Romendikil II, sent his son Valakar as an ambassador to dwell for a while with Vidugavia, who called himself King of Rovanion. While Romendikil wished only that Valakar would make himself acquainted with the language, manners, and policies of the Northmen, he far exceeded his father's designs and wedded Vidugavia's daughter. This union was scrutinized for the high men of Gondor already looked askance at the Northmen among them, and it was a thing unheard of before that the heir to the crown, or any son of the king, should wed one of lesser and alien race. In part, the hesitation of the Dúnedain in this matter was practical. The Northmen were short-lived according to the fate of lesser men. Would the future king of Gondor fall from the majesty of the kings of men? It is notable that the kin strife arose as a direct result of an occurrence that would not have been unusual or remarkable among the Dúnedain of Umbar, the black Numenorians, who had themselves quickly mingled and intermarried with the Herodrim. And yet when a marriage to one of the daughters of the Northmen was undertaken by the heir to Gondor, precisely these parts of the realm would rise against Osgiliath. We are told that there was already rebellion in the southern provinces when King Valakar grew old. Where was the rebellion precisely? The southern provinces surely included Umbar, but it is also possible that they included South Gondor, the land south of the Poros. The brief nature of the record, simply stating rebellion in the southern provinces without further elaboration, suggests that this rebellion was not thought to be of great dramatic consequence by the analyst, which may be an indication that the greatest unrest occurred far from the core of Gondor's realm along the lower Anduin. In one sense, the rebellion was unsuccessful, otherwise we would have heard of secession rather than rebellion, and the carving out of Umbar as a separate province, and of South Gondor as a debatable and desert land, would have occurred a few decades earlier. While the sources are silent on this matter, in some way the rebellion must have been put down, perhaps merely with the display of force and the presence of soldiers, perhaps there was fighting. One way or another, the response to the rebellion would itself have strained manpower and trust, but the civil war would be held off until Valakar's death in 1432 and the accession of his son, the half-Northman Eldakar. But while the rebellion seems to have been relatively inconsequential in the sense that Gondor lost no territory as a direct result of this unrest, the rebellion clearly indicated where support for the various parties lay. We are told that folk flocked to Eldakar from Kalinardon and Anorian and Athelion. In other words, Eldakar's strength lay in the northern and eastern parts of Gondor, that of the rebels in the south. The rebellion was significant then in exposing the fault lines within Gondor society. In the brief narrative of the kin strife, the war is not portrayed in great detail. Only three military engagements are mentioned, the siege at Osgiliath, the battle at the crossings of Erui, and the final siege at Pelargir. Nonetheless, there are hints as to the tragedy and intensity of the conflict. We hear that when the confederates led by the descendants of the kings rose against Eldakar, he opposed them to the end of his strength. This must refer to the five-year period between 1432 and 1437, from Eldakar's crowning to his flight from Osgiliath into exile. Surely more fighting occurred in this time than only the siege at Osgiliath, but these battles and maneuvers in which Eldakar opposed the rebels to the end of his strength have not been described. Perhaps, given the rebels' preference for the fleets, much of the fighting occurred along the coasts. We might also imagine that the rebellions prior to Eldakar's crowning 
had strained Gondor's resources sufficiently to allow the rebels to seize power in the southern provinces, especially in Umbar, which would have made an excellent location for disaffected nobles of the South Kingdom to acquire power and prestige at a remove from the interference of Osgiliath. It is not said that Umbar was lost prior to 1448, when the Tale of Years states that rebels escape and seize Umbar, but it is most likely that in the years between 1432 and 1437, Umbar had been effectively sundered from Gondor's control. Likely the establishing of the rebels at Umbar in 1448, where they made a refuge for all the enemies of the king and a lordship independent of his crown, indicates not a sudden overthrow, but simply an official recognition of a situation that had long held. Umbar was seen not only as a symbol of the glories of the past, it was also considered an essential part of the pacification of the Haradrim further inland. When it was lost to Gondor, the realm was diminished in the south, and its hold upon the men of the Harad was loosened. Indeed, from this point until Alessar's day, Gondor was largely on the defensive with regard to the Southrons. The entry for 1551 states that Hiramindikil II defeats the men of Harad, but this south victor's achievement was less than his namesakes, and did not result in subjugation of the Southrons, as we will see. However, the power of Eldakar's chief rival, the usurper Castamir, seems to have been centered on Pelargir, not Umbar. He was the captain of ships, a title linked with Pelargir, where he proposed to relocate the king's seat, and indeed his sons fled to Pelargir after Castamir's death at the crossings of Erui. Unable to resist Eldakar there, they fled in turn to Umbar, which must have seemed a receptive location from which to carry on their war. Castamir's coastal support may give us a clue as to why, though Eldakar resisted to the end of his strength, he was ultimately cornered in Osgiliath. Castamir appears to have drawn his strength from the coasts and men of the ships, and during the rebellions at the end of Valakar's reign, he may have spent time currying favor with other confederates in Umbar and South Gondor. Eldakar would have been compelled to defend Osgiliath, seat of the kings, lest its loss lend legitimacy to the rebels, who were themselves, we are told, led by descendants of the kings. We may then imagine that the first five years of the Civil War was characterized by maneuver and diplomacy, attempting to seize the allegiance of important cities and nobles, for example, rather than by great battles and prolonged sieges. Osgiliath was open to attack from land and sea, and so Eldakar may have felt unable to move the greater part of his army beyond its walls, instead manning friendly strongholds like Minas Anor and tasking smaller forces with capturing rebel towns. But despite his strenuous resistance, Eldakar was ultimately besieged in Osgiliath, where the fighting seems to have been particularly fierce. Eldakar held the city long, until hunger and the greater forces of the rebels drove him out, leaving the city in flames. In that siege and burning, the Tower of the Stone of Osgiliath was destroyed, and the Palantir was lost in the waters. The victor, Castamir, nearest by blood of the rebels to the crown, would rule for a decade until Eldakar's return. But Castamir came to be known as a cruel man, as he had first shown in the taking of Osgiliath. He caused Ornendil, son of Eldakar, who was captured, to be put to death, and the slaughter and destruction done to the city at his bidding far exceeded the needs of war. This was remembered in Minas Anor and in Athelion, and there love for Castamir was further lessened when it became seen that he cared little for the land, and thought only of the fleets, and purposed to remove the king's seat to Pelargir. Incidentally, this preference of a villain like Castamir for the sea is interesting and seems somewhat uncharacteristic in Tolkien. Usually his heroes are associated with the sea and their enemies dread it. But in Castamir we have a miniature picture of the tyrants of Numenor, who used flame and sacrificial murder to cow the men of Middle-earth. His sons and their descendants the Corsairs are a still more pitiful shadow of Numenorean sea rule, a people without a land, whose only hope is in sudden raid and murder. It is also interesting that Castamir's center of power, Pelargir, was the oldest settlement of the faithful. Castamir was a rebel and a usurper, but in his ancestry he may not have been a king's man. Regardless, Castamir had the greatest following of all the rebels, for he was the captain of ships, and was supported by the people of the coasts and the great havens of Pelargir and Umbar. The coasts here could refer to any coastline in Gondor, Harondor, or farther south, but the special mention of Pelargir and Umbar, and that Castamir cared little for the land, must mean that if he enjoyed support between the Harnan and the Poros, such support did not extend far inland. Indeed, while the Kinstrife seems to have been a two-sided affair, with the supporters of Castamir arrayed against those of Eldakar, we may well imagine a more complex picture, 
Castamir, after all, had the greatest following of all the rebels, indicating that he was not the only usurper, but the one who was in the end most successful. The rebellion in the southern provinces prior to Eldakar's crowning may indeed have been an initial sorting of the hierarchy of these would-be usurpers, and it may have been the case that in the inland regions of Harondor, other contenders emerged whom Castamir had either to entice or destroy. Or ignore. We hear nothing of any military movements in Harondor during the Kinstrife. It is not known what precisely Castamir did during his ten-year rule, but securing that rule seems not to have been a major aim. Disaffected rebels and loyalists, therefore, may have remained in South Gondor to squabble amongst themselves in the apparent absence of any strong leadership. Eldakar had meanwhile fled to the north, to his kinsfolk in Rovanion, to muster his strength for a return. When he did, his support came from Kalinardon, Anorian, and Ithilien. It did not apparently come from South Gondor. Probably support could not have come from there, even if he had had any considerable number of supporters in that region. By the time of Eldakar's return, his attention was focused squarely upon Castamir, clearly his chief obstacle to re-establishing his legitimate rule. That meant moving swiftly against the roots Castamir had attempted to set down in the core of Gondor's territories. We do not know the details of Eldakar's route south to reassert his position. No doubt his exile had been spent in and around the lands of his wife's father, Vidugavia, east of Mirkwood and south of the Kelduin, probably close to the eaves of the forest. From there he could have planned to pass over Anduin at the Undeeps through Kalinardon and Anorian, and to his fateful meeting with Castamir at the crossings of Erui. The fact that Eldakar met Castamir at the River Erui suggests that Castamir had already, in fact, if not in law, removed the king's seat to Pelargir. Castamir's harsh treatment of Osgiliath would have made it undesirable as a residence, to say nothing of the usurper's preference for the sea. Eldakar's great army, swelled by supporters from Gondor, may have dwarfed the forces available to the usurper, and at any rate the crossings of Erui seem the most defensible place to attempt to hold an army moving southward toward Pelargir. Castamir's hopes and rule ended here, however. He was slain by Eldakar, and his sons and the remnant of his forces retreated to Pelargir, where they held out long against the king, with others of their kin and many people of the fleets. Eldakar's lack of ships allowed the rebels to summon more of their supporters by sea, and in the end to sail to Umbar, to establish a lordship independent of Gondor. The kinstrife ended, but for the first time in at least 500 years, the South Kingdom was bounded by the Poros. In the aftermath of the kin strife, life in Harondor may have continued on in some independent capacity, in patches at least, perhaps with some areas sometimes loyal to Gondor and sometimes to the Corsairs. The activity of this period was probably concentrated along the coasts. Eldakar's Gondor had suffered the loss of its fleet over the course of the kin slaying, so any actions of Gondor in the region would have been small in scale, ferrying troops over the mouths of the Anduin or marching them over the Poros. Gondor was stronger, but the Corsairs would have had greater mobility. Gondor was thus probably incapable of saving the coastal settlements from the depredations of the Corsairs, and the Corsairs were probably incapable of driving too far inland, at least in a permanent capacity. The statement that after the founding of this independent lordship of Umbar, South Gondor became a debatable land between the Corsairs and the kings suggests a situation that seems at odds with what scant evidence we do have about the Corsairs themselves, namely that they were a sea power, not a land power. That is, the image of the entirety of Harondor laid waste by the constant passage of armies, raids, and battles does not fit with how Tolkien invited readers to see them. In his words, similar to the Mediterranean Corsairs, sea robbers with fortified bases. The Barbary Corsairs, which Tolkien no doubt had in mind here, were certainly destructive, but we do not picture them locked in a centuries-long land struggle with a single powerful enemy. We do not know how far the Poros and the Harnan were navigable, but Harondor itself is about 250 miles east to west and some 200 north to south. If the Corsairs were primarily sea robbers, it seems unlikely that they would be able to readily access enough of that territory to consistently prevent Gondor's superior forces from recapturing it. When the sons of Castamir escaped Eldakar's siege of Pelargir and established themselves at Umbar, they made a refuge for all the enemies of the king and a lordship independent of his crown. All the enemies of the king sounds expansive and may be intended to indicate not only the surviving rebels of the kinstrife, but any folk, perhaps even including old Numenorean colonies farther south along the coast, as well as nearby Haradrian groups, who would not be led by Gondor. <laughs> 
and the words established themselves and made a lordship indicate greater pretensions than setting up a pirate base. The fate of Harondor and the rivalry, and indeed even a measure of equality that is emphasized as existing between the Corsairs and the Kings, makes the Corsairs seem a more politically ambitious entity than the Barbary pirates who operated under the Ottoman Empire. This power is emphasized further by the statement that Umbar remained at war with Gondor for many lives of men. Umbar, the new lordship, is here given for the first time, as it were, a political life of its own, as a power in its own right, and one which could make war upon the great kingdom of Gondor itself. But the description of a Harandor debated between the Corsairs and the Kings requires us to imagine that throughout their long history, with its varied fortunes, Umbar maintained an ability to match Gondor south of the Poros, not merely to harass its fleets and coasts, but to actually prevent its reoccupation of that territory. This interpretation is difficult to square with the lack of evidence for campaigns, sieges, and battles in the region. Harondor may have lain between the Corsairs and the Kings in a geographical sense, but it seems unlikely that the two forces matched each other throughout the long centuries in which that land was laid waste and deserted. In short, the destruction of Harondor and the continued contesting of the region must have involved the aid or imposition of other groups. We have seen how there were other, lesser players in the kinstrife, rebels who were not of Castamir's party, and that some of them may have held lands in Harondor. It is at least notable that during the kinstrife itself, Harondor was not viewed as an essential theater of operations by either side. Certainly the ancient cities and strongholds along the lower Anduin, the heartland of Gondor, were the central prize. But the fact that both sides later contested the regions of Harondor, and yet appear to have drawn no notable strength from the region themselves during the Civil War, may suggest that the people of South Gondor remained apart from both parties in the conflict. We may guess why. The Harnin had been the frontier with Haredwaith since Higher Mendicil's day some four centuries before. South Gondor was therefore open to the exchanges of trade and conflict with the men of Harad, which would have given the province a different set of experiences and concerns than those current in Osgiliath. Folk in South Gondor would have looked askance at Valakar's northern wife and son, not so much because they were not of pure Dunedanic race, for traffic with the Haradrim may have resulted in its own particular blend in Harondor, but because Rovanian was far away, and the Northmen had a very different history with Gondor. The Haradrim had been peaceable since 1050, but the Northmen had proven themselves unreliable neighbors, as recently as the 1240s raiding Gondor and allying with its enemies. Under the kings, the Northmen had been brought into the kingdom, their lands added as a bulwark, in part to ensure they behaved themselves. Now with the king of their own blood on the throne, these rowdy folk would enjoy even greater honor and influence. To men in South Gondor, a shift in the balance of power in the favor of the king would have been obviously imminent. And yet not all joined Castamir, who already wielded prestige of his own as captain of ships. Many on the coasts of Harondor would have followed him, but of those further inland, there would have been great landowners whose wealth came from the no doubt fertile land that was irrigated by the rivers and open to the airs of the sea, or from commerce and exchange with the peoples of Harad, whose kings and kingdoms presumably did not disappear after Hire Mendicil I. These men of South Gondor would have had loyalties of their own, neither to the ships of Castamir nor to the wild horsemen of Eldakar. Their neutrality in the central clashes of the kinstrife would have marked them as targets, no less than their wealth. But whatever the nature of the ties between these inland magnates of South Gondor and the Haradrim, the latter seem not to have aided them or exploited their tenuous position. Only in 1540, some hundred years after the establishment of Umbar as an independent lordship, do we hear of the Southrons involving themselves in Gondor's affairs. In this year, we read a sparse entry in the annals, King Aldemir slain in war with the Harad and Corsairs of Umbar. Eleven years later, in 1551, Hire Mendicil II defeats the men of Harad. We know sadly little of these campaigns, but the records are just enough to remind us that the Corsairs and the Haradrim are distinct parties, not always allied or in support of one another. The fighting of 1540 is the first we hear of conflict with the Haradrim in almost 500 years. Put another way, it took the Corsairs a century to acquire Southrons as allies. The Haradrim seem to have been content with the status quo under Hire Mendicil I, not stirring up war against Gondor until after the kinstrife, and when the Civil War did erupt, they did not move swiftly to exploit it. An earlier version of the Tale of Years in Peoples of Middle-earth expands the account slightly. 
we learn that Aldemir fell in battle with the rebelling kings of Harad, allied with the rebels of Umbar, and that Hire Mendekil II took his name after a great victory over Harad in vengeance for his father. It is interesting in these accounts to note the gradual shift in emphasis. In the beginning, the Kinstrife is, of course, a civil war involving descendants of Gondor's kings. In 1540, the Haradrim join forces with Umbar, and in 1551, only the Haradrim are mentioned. In the Battle of 1540, which saw the death of Aldemir, son of Eldakar, the Corsairs were involved. Either Aldemir was the aggressor here, attempting to retake Umbar, or he was defending against the invading allies of Umbar and Harad. Information is scant, but one detail common to both sources is that Harad is mentioned first, which may suggest that the rebelling kings of Harad were now the senior partner, or the instigators of the war. The fact that his son took the name Hire Mendekil and targeted the Haradrim rather than Umbar indicates that he saw Harad as the greater threat. We may guess, then, that Aldemir's slaying was at the hands of the Salrons, in the course of a land-based invasion of Gondor that would have proceeded up the Harad Road, through Harondor, and towards Athelion. This need not have been the case. The Southron kings could have instigated the war by declaring their independence, prompting Aldemir to march south in an attempt to bring them to heel. But Umbar's involvement is perhaps best explained by imagining a Haradrian invasion made in cooperation with Corsair fleets, who could have distracted and divided Aldemir's forces, leaving him weaker against the Haradrim than he otherwise would have been. Hire Mendekil II's retributive victory over the rebelling kings of Harad must have been an entirely land-based campaign, since Umbar would be held by the Corsairs until 1810. Likely, Hire Mendekil's forces mustered around the nexus of the Lower Anduin, Pelargir, Minasan, Noros, Gileath, Othelion, and marched through Harondor, crossing the Harnin and winning their victory in territory that was now far outside Gondor's borders. This, again, need not be the only interpretation. It is possible that Hire Mendekil's victory was won defensively somewhere in Athelion, say, but the back-and-forth nature of the conflicts of these centuries and the mention of vengeance suggests that in this case Gondor was on the offensive. The apparent lack of cooperation between Umbar and Harad in 1551 could explain why Hire Mendekil II was able to win a seemingly decisive victory against the rebelling kings of the Southrons so soon after the disaster which saw the death of his father and the likely destruction of his army. We see time and again that the Haradrim are unwilling to war with Gondor in the absence of external aid or instigation, and that when they do march to war they are only victorious with the aid of these allies, and sometimes not even then, as was the case in the War of the Ring. Lastly, the picture outlined above of the events between 1540 and 1551 of Haradrian armies marching north to attack Gondor and Gondorian armies marching south to attack Harad has the benefit of explaining precisely how not only the coasts of Harondor, but also the inland regions were finally laid waste and turned to the debatable and desert land that the cartographers knew in later centuries. In the early years of the Kinstrife, and for some years after, inland Harondor may have been relatively safe from military action, but when Umbar could finally leverage the cooperation of the Haradrim, any inland independent lords of Harondor were doomed. Apparently not having supported Eldakar or Castamir, they could count on no support from the heirs of either. For a century or so, they may have been left alone nevertheless, as the threat of Umbar to Gondor's coasts would likely have seemed the greater priority than punishing quiescent if recalcitrant rebels south of the Poros, and Castamir's sons would have been preoccupied with establishing their new lordship and harassing Gondor itself. But their tenuous existence astride the great land route south of Athelion could not last long. When the rebelling kings of Harad deemed themselves strong enough, they joined forces with Umbar in a move that sealed Harondor's fate. The northern march of the Haradrim must have devastated a region already under strain, cut off politically from potential allies north and south, and suffering too from the repercussions of the wastage of Osgiliath and the loss of so many people in Gondor during the Kinstrife. Hire Mendekil II's return through the region would have been the final blow. It would also be the last time any king or army of Gondor ventured south of the Poros by road. In 1810, Telemetar made the retaking of Umbar a priority. No king of Gondor sought to reoccupy Harondor until after the War of the Ring. The Great Plague of 1636 was remembered in Gondor as the greatest evil, greater even than the Kinstrife. It is during this time that Osgiliath became partly deserted and began to fall into ruin owing to the great numbers of the people who had died there and elsewhere in Gondor. Tarondar removed the king's house permanently to Minas Anor as a result. 
But these years may have been relatively quiet for Herondor. Nearly a century after Hire Mendekil II's last great campaign in the region, you may suppose that it was still largely depopulated. And this very depopulation would have blunted the plague's impact, and it certainly seems to have weakened the military strength of the nearby powers. Two years before the onset of the sickness in Gondor, we read that Corsairs, the great grandsons of Castamir, ravage Pelargir and slay King Minardil. There would be no reprisal until almost two centuries had passed. No campaigns through or near Harondor are recorded during the 17th or 18th centuries of the Third Age. However, in the wake of the plague, there may have been some movement into Harondor of a more peaceful nature. Movement out of Osgiliath may not have been entirely towards the west. We read that few of those who had fled from the plague into Athelion or to the western dales were willing to return. Escaping the sickness meant fleeing the urban center of the South Kingdom for the countryside. With an increase in the population of Athelion as a result, we may wonder whether settlement was attempted south of the Poros. As a region that had long been deserted, Harondor may at this time have seemed attractive to those seeking empty spaces. We hear of no coordinated movements in this direction, of course, but while the center of political gravity in Gondor was reoriented westward, there came an associated loss of control over the population, many of whom were no longer willing to return to city life, and therefore would have been sundered from the business and obligations of the kingdom. The region north of the Poros was, perhaps, beginning to resemble the region south. At the opening of the 19th century of the Third Age, we read of an unusual uptick in Gondor's fortunes in the south. King Telumetar, remembering the death of Minardil and being troubled by the insolence of the corsairs who raided his coasts even as far as the Anphalus, gathered his forces and in 1810 took Umbar by storm. We are not told whether this attack was made by sea or by land or both, but if the conquest of Umbar resulted in Gondor again taking possession of Harondor, the possession was brief. Nevertheless, a reconquest of Harondor seems unlikely. Hire Mendekil II's victory over the Haradrim in 1551 had been enough to ensure a respite from trouble beyond the Harnan, but it did not lead to anything like the dominance that had held during the apogee of Gondor's strength, when the Southron kings sent their sons as hostages to the royal court at Osgiliath. And Gondor after the plague shown signs of exhaustion. The corsair attack on Pelargir, the dwindling of its people in Athelion, the removal of the king's seat from Osgiliath all signaled the kingdom's decline. Umbar itself would not be held long, though the Corsairs were soundly beaten. In that war, we read, the last descendants of Castamir perished, and Umbar was again held for a while by the kings. Telumetar added to his name the title Umbardakil. But in the new evils that soon befell Gondor, Umbar was again lost, and fell into the hands of the men of the Harad. One of the most unusual elements of this narrative is the imprecision of the timeline. We are given a date for Telumetar's conquest of Umbar, 1810, but no date of Umbar's later loss. So how long was it held by Gondor's kings? The men of the Harad must have possessed Umbar for some time. Their control of the region likely began during the invasions of the Wainriders, the most reasonable referent for the new evils that soon befell Gondor. These began in 1851 to 1856. We are told that in the last Wainrider campaign of 1944, which involved a Haradrian invasion of South Athelion, assistance in this invasion was not at that time available from Umbar. This must mean that no sea forces were able to cooperate with the Haradrian land invasion, which, since the latter could not cross the Anduin without the aid of ships, would be compelled to march northward through Athelion, an increasingly narrow land where a large force could be held off with a smaller. Why would assistance from Umbar be unavailable for the purposes of the Haradrian invasion of 1944? This could be taken to mean that Gondor still possessed Umbar, but we hear of no attacks upon Gondor-held Umbar at this time, nor do we hear of coordination of Gondorian forces in Umbar with the defenses against the Haradrim and the Wainriders. Since we also hear that Umbar fell to men of the Harad in, that is, during, the new evils of the Wainrider invasion, Haradrian forces must have taken Umbar between 1851 and 1944. But if the Haradrim possessed Umbar, why could Umbar not offer assistance to their invasion of Athelion? The reason could be twofold. First, the men of the Harad were not a single, united political group. Prior to the Kinstrife, we hear of kings in the south. 
These dynasties were significant enough entities for their princes to be held as hostages in the court of Gondor's king. They may then have represented lineages with some power and ancientry and rivalries that were only perhaps temporarily quelled when Gondor was strong enough to impose its will on the nearest realms, or when they were united against the Dúnedain. Thus, the Haradrim who held the strongholds of Umbar need have owed no allegiance or friendship to any other leader in the south. And the Haradrim who invaded Athelion in 1944 were, most probably, those whose power was centered further east. The prelude to the 1944 campaign was war between the eastern Wayne Riders, Cond, and their neighbors further south. These last neighbors would have been men of Harad whose territories lay south or southeast of Mordor. It is this group who would have been in conflict and then in cooperation with the Wayne Riders. The holdings of this particular group of Haradrim, then, lay several hundred miles east of Umbar, and we cannot assume that there existed any network of alliance or fealty that united the long leagues between. The Haradrian invasion of Athelion in 1944 may have been made without the involvement of those who held Umbar. Second, the Haradrim are nowhere described as skilled seafarers. There may have been some Haradrim among the three fleets of the long winter invasion of 2758, but the use of the word Harad in connection with these fleets may reflect the place of origin of the fleets rather than the race of the sailors. In any case, even if this invasion included Haradrim on the ships, it is a rare such occurrence in the histories. When the men of the Harad took Umbar during the late 1800s or early 1900s then, they may have done little more than fortify the strongholds. Certainly we hear of no attacks by fleets manned by Haradrim during or after this period, and so, if during 1944 Umbar was still in the possession of these Haradrim, even had they been willing to offer aid to their kinsmen, that aid would have been in the form of troops or supplies for the land campaign. The Haradrim in Umbar were not in a position to offer aid by ship. Gondor then held Umbar for some decades after 1810, possibly a century, but then lost it. Not to the Corsairs, whose remnants were still reeling after Telemetar's violent retaking of the region and destruction of its 400-year-old dynasty, but to the natives of the region, the men of the Harad. This later loss of Umbar seems to have been less sudden or dramatic than previously. The analyst seems to describe not an assault or conquest, but perhaps the realization of a new reality, similar to how the fortress and tower of Orthanc would gradually come under the dominion of men not of Gondorian descent later in the Third Age. The slippage of Umbar from the hands of the kings is further suggestion that Harondor was not held by Gondor at this time, Umbar, after 1810, feels like an isolated outpost, an island of Dunedainic civilization ringed round by a sea of Southron barbarians. Its conquest was a point of pride for Telumetar, who died in 1850, but his successors had in the Wainriders a powerful new threat to deal with. It is likely that only a small garrison remained to resist the tide. However Umbar was ultimately taken, its fall marks the beginning of an independent and increasingly powerful Harad. During the roughly thousand-year span to follow, the men of the south were not under the dominion of kings of Gondor, lords of Umbar, or even Sauron, who was based either at Dol Guldur or in the east at this time. 2885 would be the high water mark. In that year, the leaders of the Harad, without any external aid, were capable of occupying Harondor and bringing great strength to bear against Gondor, in an assault that seems nearly to have succeeded. If it had, it might have resulted in the permanent orientation of Harondor toward the men of the south, or perhaps even the destruction of Gondor itself. Owing to the nature of our sources, we know very little indeed of events south of the Poros, but from 1810 onward, the Corsairs apparently ceased to be the senior partner in cooperation with the Haradrim, and act as equals or even the weaker party. The Wayne Riders were the third great evil to befall Gondor, following the Kin Strife and the Great Plague, for almost a hundred years, from 1851 to 1944, these Easterlings, stronger and better armed than any that had appeared before, troubled the borders of Gondor, breaking its hold over Ravanion and slaying two of its kings in open battle. Most of the activity of the Wayne Riders was concentrated north, in the lands between the Anduin and the Sea of Rune, but prior to 1944 there had been war between these Easterlings and the Southrons. The Eastern Wayne Riders expanded south to attack Cond and their neighbors further south. The wars and feuds that Kalimetar observed among the Haradrim prior to his 1899 campaign against the Wayne Riders may refer to these events, or they may represent the coalescing and centralization of Southron power that seems to have progressed throughout this period. 
Chroniclers of Gondor would attribute the end of these wars to the influence of Sauron, who convinced these peoples to unite against the South Kingdom, but the wars themselves may have been inconclusive. It is likely that in passing south of Cond, the Wayne Riders were nearing or exceeding the limits of their expansion and logistics, and the conflicts with the men of the Harad may have been of little ultimate consequence no matter the outcome, since either side would have been unable to turn victory into lasting gain. These wars then may have simply confirmed borders that had already been established, and provided opportunity for these peoples to meet and cooperate against their common foe. 1944 saw Gondor put to the test against a coordinated attack. Wayne Riders and their new allies from Cond mustered south of the Sea of Rune and swiftly advanced westward along the line of the arid Lithui, while at the same time in the south, an army of Harad had crossed the river Poros. These Haradrim are specified as being men of near Harad, that is, roughly the region beyond the Harnan, but adjacent to it, lying also southward of Mordor and southwest of Cond. In Christopher Tolkien's map, near Harad is distinct from far Harad, which is placed some 300 miles southeast of Umbar. Near Harad was certainly not a Haradrian category. It possibly dates to the years of Hyre Mendicil I, when Gondor received tribute and allegiance from the Southrons, and may have distinguished those who were thus aligned with Gondor from those more distant kingdoms or chieftains which were not. However, it is rare that any attempt is made in the sources to specify the regional or political origin of Gondor's enemies. That these forces were men of near Harad may suggest that they were smaller in number or more provincial than the Southron hosts Sauron would muster during the War of the Ring. At the Pelennor Fields, we hear of men of Far Harad, indicating that the reach of Sauron was greater than that of the Haradrian leaders of the 1944 campaign, who could probably only summon their own people to the war. Near Harad is mentioned twice in this context. In Appendix A, we hear that the Wayne Riders had passed south of Mordor and made alliance with the men of Cond and of Near Harad, and a footnote to Kirion and Eorl states that the danger of the southern attack in 1944 was rightly thought to be less, for an attack proceeding from Near Harad, unless it had assistance from Umbar, which was not at that time available, could more easily be resisted and contained. It could not cross the Anduin, and as it went north passed into a narrowing land between the river and the mountains. So it proved in the end. Aornil, captain of Gondor's southern army, heard news of the oncoming of the enemy from his base in Pelargir, and crossed the Anduin with half his force, and leaving by design the fords of the Poros undefended, had encamped some forty miles north in South Athelion. We are not told the details of this battle, but Aornil won a great victory in South Athelion and destroyed the army of Harad that had crossed the river Poros. We know nothing more. It seems Aornil left half of his force behind in Pelargir, whether they played any role in the campaign or battle itself is unclear. Perhaps the Haradrim were destroyed with only the other half, perhaps because they had been lured into a portion of the narrowing land north of the Poros. It is interesting to note that the Haradrian threat during this attack is consistently downplayed. Certainly the Wayne Riders are thought to represent the graver danger to Gondor. Perhaps the Southrons, somewhat weakened by their fighting in the east, were not very numerous, Perhaps, too, having to cross the desert land of Harondor proved too great a strain on their ability to maintain supply. While we know nothing of the numbers or troop composition in the Haradrian army, Aornil had some strategic aim in deploying well north of the crossings. Not only did it allow him, after his victory, to turn north more quickly to face the Wayne Riders, not only may the narrowing land have given his army an advantage of terrain, it may also have put further strain on the Haradrim, who now were operating in territory utterly unfamiliar to them, but well known to the men of Gondor. The 1944 campaign was the first time in almost 400 years that a significant military operation had been conducted in Harondor. However, there is no indication of Haradrian settlement of the area, and this despite the fact that Gondor seems to have had little or no interest in reoccupying or defending it. Perhaps even so, the Southrons felt the risk was too great to attempt outright conquest south of the Poros. In 1944, Minas Ithil had not yet been occupied by the Ringwraiths, and Gondor had freedom of movement throughout Athelion. Gondor also seems to have been well informed of what transpired not only in the east among the Wayne Riders, but in the south beyond the Harnan. Aornil, as we have seen, had received news of the oncoming of the Southrons, and was able to make his dispositions accordingly. Presumably news would also have reached him or other captains of Gondor had the Haradrim attempted to settle permanently in Harondor. The threat from such settlements would have been too great to ignore. But to the men of near Harad, the campaign of 1944 was not about the short-term annexation of territory. 
The territorial gains would come later, if Gondor could first be destroyed. And while the Haradrian assault was itself destroyed by Aarnil, things went quite differently in the north, where King Andoher and both his sons were slain by the Wainriders near the Moranon. Only the valor of Aarnil and his southern army saved Gondor from total defeat by surprising the encamped Wainriders and driving them into the dead marshes. Had it not been for the success of the Battle of the Camp, the Haradrim may well have been able to seize power in the region, despite the loss of their army. With the Corsairs apparently still weakened and Haradrim still in possession of Umbar, men of the south could have easily moved into Harandor while the Wainriders enjoyed the spoils of Minas Anor and plundered the fiefs of Gondor. The failure in 1944 of both the Haradrim and the Wainriders to defeat Gondor was certainly a setback in the fortunes of the south, but significantly there was no reprisal by Gondor, no counter-campaign south of the Poros or Harnin to chastise the men of Harad. Gondor's victories in Athelion in 1944 merely preserved the status quo. The greatest impact of these victories was upon the Wainrider Confederacy itself, which seems to have splintered shortly thereafter. Of the political organization of the South, little is known, but the Southrons at least were out of the reach of the kings. 1975 saw the last great action of Gondor's fleet, the sending to Lindon of an army to the aid of the North Kingdom. Coming some 30 years after the defeat of the Wainriders and Haradrim in Athelion, this campaign is significant in what it reveals about Gondor's position. Its king, Aarnil, hero of 1944, who defeated both the Haradrim and then the Wainriders in the Battle of the Camp, felt secure enough in his power to send aid north by sea. The 1975 campaign saw the end of both Arthedain and Angmar, and, had the Witch King also been destroyed, perhaps Gondor could have afforded to turn its attention to its unchastened enemies in the south. In the event, a quarter century later the Lord of the Nazgul would re-emerge to besiege and then take Minas Ithil. With this stroke, Athelion would become largely contested ground itself for the next thousand years, confining Gondor mostly to guarding the line of the Anduin. Harondor was by now very far from the thoughts of the kings. During the roughly 400 years of the Watchful Peace, from 2063 to 2460, the Tale of Years has little to say about the actions of Gondor. Indeed, the stewards seem to have done little. We are told that after the fall of Minas Ithil in 2002, the Nazgul were not expelled while the Third Age lasted. This may suggest that expulsion was attempted. However, if they were made, no such attempts are recorded. Minas Ithil had fallen in 2002, and it is remarkable that apart from King Aarner's answer to the Witch King's challenge, we know of no attempt of Gondorian soldiery to even visit, much less retake that important city and fortress. Minas Morgul seems never to have been considered a target for a military campaign. No doubt the place was seen as an intangible sort of threat. What use were swords against the sorcery of the Nazgul? As the centuries wore on, Gondor's operations in Athelion were limited to reconnaissance and ambush. We are also told that at the end of this period, many of the people that still remained in Athelion deserted it. Given the picture here, it is perhaps no wonder that Harondor, which had been deserted by this time for some 500 years, was largely written off by Gondor. The kingdom was no longer capable of holding territory and strongholds even in the heart of its realm. Between Minas Tirith and the Poros, the leagues had grown long and dark. Somewhat paradoxically, however, this receding of Gondor's power to the north and west may have allowed Harondor to regenerate to a degree. No longer seen as an avenue for campaigns when Gondor's foes were much closer to home, Harondor could have been somewhat resettled, likely by men from the south. Any such settlers would not have been associated with the kings or powerful groups of the Harad, since these would have been in a position to press their advantage against Gondor at this time. Instead, the Haradrian powers seem to have been focused inward, perhaps consolidating their hold over Umbar or recalibrating their relative positions of status after the 1944 defeat in South Athelion. Settlers of Harondor, then, would have been independent, small groups, perhaps herders who would move across a mostly unpopulated landscape that offered opportunities for grazing alongside the rivers, in the plains, and in the mountain vales to the east. Few travelers would have crossed the Poros going in either direction at this time. The ringwraiths remained quiet in the Morgul Vale. The end of the Watchful Peace would have brought changes south of the Poros. 2475 marks the appearance of Uruks, black orcs of great strength, who swept across Athelion and took Osgiliath. 
These gains were reversed, and Gondor retook Athelion, but Osgiliath was finally ruined, and its great stone bridge was broken. No people dwelt there afterwards. It is difficult to imagine that many people dwelt east of Anduin after this time, but we may suppose that with the opening of Mordor and the renewal of assaults on Gondor, some of the influence of Minas Morgul began to creep down the Harad Road. A decade later began the rule of the steward Kirion, of whom we were told that the Corsairs harried his coasts, but it was in the north that his chief peril lay. Sauron had returned to Dol Guldur and raised the Balkoth against Gondor. Sauron's main focus seems to have been the regions close to southern Mirkwood, the Balkoth, the Orcs, and the Misty Mountains, but it is possible that the 2475 stroke against Osgiliath also signaled the opening of a new line of communication between Sauron and the south. By the year 2758, though Minas Morgul had for centuries been under the power of the Nazgul, Sauron himself had not yet returned to Mordor. His power yet lay at Dol Guldur, where he had returned in 2460 after hiding in the east for some four centuries. All that time was not sufficient for Sauron to strengthen the Easterling civilizations to the heights they had achieved under the Wayne Riders. When fifty years after Sauron's return, Easterlings invaded Kalinardon, they were described as only rudely armed. The increased strength with which Sauron returned to Dol Guldur in 2460 appears therefore to have been numerical. Or at least, Sauron was not at this time greatly concerned with cultivating men. Around 2480, Orcish activity in the Misty Mountains increased, and Sauron was identified as the cause. We are told in the Tale of Years that Sauron begins to people Moria with his creatures in this year. Regardless, the Easterlings, Balkoth, who overran Kalinardon, were only stopped by Eorl, though they were not entirely destroyed as a threat. Some two centuries later, in 2758, Rohan was attacked from west and east and overrun. Only in Peoples of Middle-earth do we find that Easterlings are identified as joining the attack. Likely they were the successors of the Balkoth, who remained in their lands east and south of Mirkwood, in the vicinity of Dol Guldur, lands that had been lost to Gondor 900 years before. This attack seems to be almost the last stroke of the heirs of the Wayne Riders. Their invasion of Rohan was made in concert with the movements of Corsairs, who sent fleets not only against Gondor, but also as far north as the mouth of the Aizen and joined the assault on Rohan, as well as Dunlandings, who joined with the outlawed Wolf, son of Freca, in his usurpation of Edoras. The campaign of the Long Winter seems entirely to have bypassed Harandor. There was no invasion up the Harad Road into Athelion. So what kept the Haradrim out of the 2758 invasion? Their last known campaign had been north of the Poros in 1944. It would have taken time for them to recover from that defeat, but time they had, since Gondor did not pursue them into their own land, and certainly some seven centuries would have been enough to regain their lost strength. Perhaps the 1944 defeat had been more destructive of the Haradrian ruling class than the sources can tell, leaving the inland south to suffer its own period of civil war or decentralization. Or, perhaps by this time, Umbar had fallen from the hands of the Haradrim back into the possession of the Corsairs. This could be one way to account for the mention of the Harad in addition to Umbar as origin point of the three great fleets. Corsairs, retaking Umbar for themselves, would again be in a position to threaten the Haradrim, especially as these had recently suffered a defeat, and in the course of establishing dominance over the Southrons, could have conscripted some of them into the naval invasion force of 2758. A third option could be that the Haradrim did not suffer over much from civil strife or from corsair resurgence, but were engaged in filling the power vacuum left by the dissolution of the Wayne Rider Confederacy. The steward Verondil went hunting near the Sea of Rune not long after the Wayne Rider defeat of 1944, which implies that the Wayne Riders had lost much territory. While Gondor could not regain the lands in Rovania that they had lost, other powers may have had different fortunes. And while we may not go so far as to imagine Southrons holding territory east or northeast of Mordor, the Wayne Rider's reach had been long enough to enforce their will on Khand and threaten near Harad. The Easterlings' defeat could have left room for Haradrian kings to attempt something similar, pushing towards Khand or further north. It should not be surprising that we have no records from Gondor of whatever transpired east of Mordor at this time. With Minas Ithil fallen and Ithilien under threat from the Morgul Lord, Gondor was forced to look to its ever-shrinking borders, and little farther. Whatever was the reason for the lack of Haradrian involvement in 2758's invasion of Gondor and Rohan, in the following century the Southrons would emerge as a major power south of the Poros, the first one Harondor had seen in almost a millennium and a half, 
bringing new life to the region in its otherwise long, dark age. The restoration of Rohan after the events of the long winter proceeded slowly. It was not until the time of King Folkwine, whose reign began no earlier than 2864, that they recovered their former strength. Indeed, although in 2759 Gondor had sent forces by the roads east and west of the mountains to drive out the Dunlendings from Rohan and even from Isengard, some Dunlending enclaves remained after this campaign. A century later, Folkwine was obliged to reconquer the West March between Adorn and Isen that Dunlendings had occupied. This region between the rivers and the mountains had been the land of Freca, father of Wolf, who had wide lands on either side of the Adorn and, near its source, made himself a stronghold. Presumably the forces of Gondor would have passed through this country in their successful campaign of 2759. We do not know precisely where the roads west of the mountains ran, yet Gondor's soldiers seem not to have troubled themselves with Freca's old stronghold. In any case, after Fulquine's successful campaign in the West March, news came that the Haradrim were assailing Gondor with great strength. Quote, in the days of Turin II, the enemies of Gondor began to move again, for Sauron was grown again to power, and the day of his arising was drawing near. All but the hardiest of its people deserted Athelion and removed west over Anduin, for the land was infested by Mordor orcs. It was Turin that built secret refuges for his soldiers in Athelion, of which Henneth Anun was the longest guarded and manned. He also fortified again the Isle of Caer Andros to defend Anorian. But his chief peril lay in the south, where the Haradrim had occupied South Gondor, and there was much fighting along the Poros. When Athelion was invaded in great strength, King Folkwine of Rohan fulfilled the oath of Eorl and repaid his debt for the aid brought by Baragond, sending many men to Gondor. With their aid, Turin won a victory at the crossings of the Poros, but the sons of Folkwine both fell in the battle. The riders buried them after the fashion of their people, and they were laid in one mound, for they were twin brothers. Long it stood, Howden Gwanner, high upon the shore of the river, and the enemies of Gondor feared to pass it. Folkwine's eagerness to repay Gondor's aid was somewhat cooled by others in his council. We are told that he was dissuaded from leading the campaign himself, but not by whom. Perhaps his sons, who were in their mid-twenties, pleaded leave to go. We can probably discount any cynical court politics at work here. Fengil, the twin's younger brother and eventual successor to their father, was only fifteen at the time of his brother's death. And while he was not remembered with praise, being known for greed of food and of gold, and was at strife with his marshals and with his children, he would probably have been too young to have had a hand in removing his older brothers by encouraging them to battle in the hopes that they would be slain. It is interesting to note that, as in the great difficulties of the long winter invasions, the greatest threat to Gondor in 2885 was not Minas Morgul. While Mordor orcs infested Athelion, Turin's chief peril lay in the south, where the Haradrim had occupied South Gondor. Since the final ruination of Osgiliath in 2475, the only activity in the region on the part of the Nazgul seems to have been the infestation of orcs. Their presence seems almost a nuisance compared to the threat of the Haradrim, which compelled Gondor's forces to commit to much fighting along the Poros. Still, the threat from these Southrons is not inseparable from the movements of the Mordor orcs, the earlier invasions of the Balkoth and Dunlendings against Rohan, the peopling of the Misty Mountains with Sauron's creatures, all of this activity benefited from the instigation or cooperation of Sauron. The reference to much fighting along the Poros implies that Gondor had concentrated its forces along that frontier. The Haradrim did not simply overrun an undermanned line of forts, but tested the defenses. Along the Poros also suggests that there were several points at which the Haradrim attempted to cross. The crossings of the Poros identified on the map, where the Harad road crosses the river, may not have been the only ford, or at least it seems likely from this description of the fighting that there were several points where the river could have been crossed by rafts, similar to the Undeeps. We are told of these attacks in the tale of years that, stirred up by the emissaries of Sauron, the Haradrim crossed the Poros and attacked Gondor. The language here, stirred up by the emissaries of Sauron, is identical to that used of the Wainrider invasion a millennium earlier. And just as in that earlier case it is unlikely that Sauron had much direct involvement in the development of the Wainrider Confederacy, so here it seems unlikely that Sauron's emissaries did more than entice the Haradrim northward. If indeed the Haradrim were not directly in Sauron's service at this time, the campaign of 2885 would be the last independent invasion of Southrons into Gondor, and it almost succeeded. <laughs> 
for they did not merely pass through Harondor on their way to Athelion. They occupied the province themselves, using it as a base. Turin's stewardship began in 2882. We do not know precisely when South Gondor was occupied, but it seems to have been not long before. In Turin's days, his enemies began to move again, which we may interpret as referring at least in part to the movements of Haradrim north of the Harnan. Thus, some 1,400 years had passed since Harondor had last been occupied, and it is notable that now, the first time a clear winner is identified in the struggle for Harondor since 1448, the occupiers were neither corsairs nor servants of the kings. In 2885, the corsairs were nursing their wounds from the defeat after the long winter, and the line of kings was broken in the South Kingdom. But the men of the Harad had risen to take their place, and to try their newfound strength in what must have been an overwhelming show of force. The magnitude of the threat posed by the Haradrim, so different from previous invasions, is emphasized by the chroniclers. Much earlier, in 1015, the Southrons had come up with great power against Umbar, but in that earlier campaign, the Haradrim had the benefit of leaders of Numenorean descent. In the invasion of 2885, the Haradrim led themselves. They were the stewards' chief peril. They invade Athelion in great strength, and Turin is obliged to send for many men from Rohan. Even with the aid of these numerous warriors, the victory of Gondor is dearly bought. Rohan's princes both fall, implying that the battle was close. It seems likely that the Southrons would have won had Rohan not answered Gondor's call, but even so, the battle may have been long in doubt. In this campaign, the Southrons could rely on the strength of their position of occupation south of the Poros, so close to the lands of Gondor itself. From here, they could draw resources, muster troops, and conserve their strength for battle. From here, too, they could direct attacks at many points along the river to confuse and divide their enemy's attention. It perhaps stands to reason that it took more than a thousand years before Harondor could again be occupied. As long as both the Corsairs and Gondor held sufficient power to strike at each other, neither could establish a sure foothold in the region. It was only after both sides had been worn out by centuries of conflict that the lines of entrenchment could harden. Gondor apparently attempted no major offenses against the Corsairs after the 1810 retaking of Umbar. Aragorn's much later attack on the Havens as Thorongil prior to the War of the Ring was intended to weaken, not destroy or replace, Corsair power. Similarly, the Corsairs seemed to have spent their strength in the long winter invasion. Though their fleets met with much success, both in Gondor and in Rohan, after their defeat, we note that the Haradrim who attack South Athelion a century later do so without Corsair support. In a way, this invasion of 2885 is a repeat of the campaign of 1944, in which Haradrim similarly were unsupported by naval forces and were thus obliged to attack Gondor over the Poros before threatening their chief strongholds and fiefs, but with the difference that the 2885 campaign was preceded by the occupation of Harondor, rather than risking all on a single march in battle. The great strength that the Haradrim were this time able to summon and direct north of the Poros was daunting, even lacking the support of the Corsairs. We may suppose that it was only thanks to the Rohirrim led by Fulcred and Fastred that Gondor was not overrun. We are told that after the twins' death, Turin sent to Fulquine a rich guild of gold. The gift may have been politically necessary, but no doubt it also reflected a genuine understanding on the part of the steward that Gondor's victory had been hard bought. The 2885 campaign left as a lasting marker one of the most evocative images of the southern borders of Gondor, that of the barrow mound of the princes of Rohan that was said to keep watch over the shores of the river Poros. But the mention that the enemies of Gondor feared to pass the mound implies that there remained enemies south of the Poros who could pass it. No doubt some at least did. Fifty-seven years later, in 2942, Sauron would return in secret to Mordor. His emissaries, who we are told stirred up the invasion of 2885, must have been hard at work in the region after the Southron's defeat. And while he surely would have preferred to see Gondor lose, he may have been able to leverage even this failure to his own gain. The men of the South would, in the coming years, be put under Sauron's leadership, no doubt assured of vengeance and success against their old foe. But they remained in Harondor, untroubled by Gondor until after the War of the Ring and the downfall of their new master. For all that the enemies of Gondor may have feared to pass Howden Gwanor, the burial mound of the princes high upon the shore of the river, no soldiers of Gondor passed the river southward until after Alessar had gained his throne. The defeat of the Haradrim in 2885 may have left Harondor occupied, 
but the Sauderons who occupied it were somewhat subdued. At least in Ecthelion's day, Aragorn did not see the region as constituting a grave threat to Gondor. Disguised as Thorongil, he often counseled Ecthelion that the strength of the rebels in Umbar was a great peril to Gondor, and a threat to the fiefs of the south that would prove deadly if Sauron moved to open war. He seems not to have perceived any comparable peril originating in Harondor. Perhaps then, although Haradrim were not driven out of Harondor after 2885, they had lost sufficient of their warriors and leaders in the battle to render them passive, at least until Sauron's agents, now able to move easily and freely through the south, could organize the many peoples beyond the Harnan and unite them under his service. Harondor, therefore, could have seen much activity in the lead-up to the War of the Ring, but it would have been the activity of preparation, the quiet build-up of troops and passage of messengers, rather than aggressive moves against Gondor. During the War of the Ring itself, the Haradrim pushed farther north than they ever had done. This is the first conflict, indeed the only one, in which Mumikil are said to be present, and the presence of the creatures at Minas Tirith and elsewhere north of the Poros raises questions about their route of travel and encampment in the lead-up to the war. We see Southrons, including at least one Mumak, marching north through Athelion, presumably towards the Moranon and thence into Mordor. With Tolkien's annotations to Pauline Baines placing elephants on the map just to the southeast of the name near Harad, due south of eastern Mordor and Cond, we may imagine that Mumikil could have been present in any of the military struggles between Gondor and the Haradrim. Presumably Faramir's rangers had already seen at least one Mumak prior to the ambush witnessed by Frodo and Sam, and the existence of hobbit rhymes about the creatures shows that they had been a part of the lore of the West for some time. Still, it seems likely that their appearance in Harondor on the way to the Pelennor Fields would have been the first time they had been seen there in many centuries at least. After the war, nothing is said of Harondor in Lord of the Rings. Elessar made peace with the peoples of Harad, we are told, but we also hear in Appendix A that on the far fields of the south the thunder of the cavalry of the Mark was heard, indicating that war with the Southrons would flare up again within the king's lifetime. Of Umbar, we learn that since the days of the sons of Castamir, it was never again completely subdued until the days of Elessar, which suggests that after the War of the Ring, Umbar would suffer a campaign of conquest, not merely negotiated peace. If we interpret Umbar's subdual as being distinct from those other military maneuvers on the far fields of the south, there would be at least two campaigns beyond the Harnan. Harondor, then, would see much activity, not only prior to the War of the Ring, but after it. Unlike the previous campaigns, these later ones would be initiated in Gondor, a reversal of direction, and no doubt a prelude to permanent settlement between the rivers, on the coasts, and along the Harad Road. With a strong realm to its north, rather than several powers of roughly equal strength on either side, Harondor may at last have been able to develop towns, cities, powerful landowners, in short, the civilization it had enjoyed more than 1,500 years before. We may well suppose that now, with the threat of Morgul and Mordor removed, and the south at least temporarily subdued, the region between Poros and Harnan could finally re-enter the kingdom as the province of South Gondor, long after it had fallen away in the civil war of the Kinstrife. <laughs>